Well, y'all ready to study the scriptures together today? Good. It's so good to see you. Okay. I'm going to be starting here in the book of John, chapter 11. Y'all know the story here of Martha and Mary and Lazarus, very dear friends of Jesus, very dear friends. And Lazarus was sick, and he's going to die. And he did die. And then Jesus came with his disciples to the town of Bethany where they lived and, and talked to them. And Martha meets them outside of the house, outside of the city, and she says, My Lord, if you had been here, my, my brother, he wouldn't have died. And she says, But now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Isn't that a statement of faith? Whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Because Jesus came in the Father's name, and He had been doing miracles from His Father's authority. He had been giving teachings based upon what the Father had taught Him, and He was about doing the works of the Father. But Lazarus was dead. Jesus says He's going to rise again, and she says, I know in the resurrection Jesus says, you don't understand yet. Let's show me where he is. And they tell him to roll the stone away. And she says, Lord, don't do that. And he's been dead four days. Things smell in there by now. That's what she said. And Jesus says, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And after Jesus said these things, he said, I, you know, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. He's praying to his Father. He's lifting up this prayer to his Father. He's praying to his Father. Father, I thank you that you've heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I'm saying this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus! Come forth. And he did. He was all bound by grave clothes. His feet were wrapped up. His face was all covered up. And Jesus said to him, Loose him and let him go. I do not have the ability to give you new life. But I know somebody who can. I don't have the ability with words or the things that I may say to, to bring you to the place where the Father is changing you from the inside, but I know somebody, I know my Father can. And I will not just speak words so that you'll be glad you came and you've been entertained. Because we come here for a reason, and that reason is to glorify God. And He doesn't share His glory with anyone else. When Jesus prayed to his disciples, or prayed with his disciples in John chapter 17, he prayed to the Father. He said, Father, one of the things he said, as you've sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So Jesus was praying for his disciples and for those who became his followers. And I think it's just amazing. Jesus uses those same exact words. The prayer that he gave to his father are some of the last words he ever spoke to his disciples. And after the resurrection, he said, As the Father has sent me, so I send you. He said he breathed on them. Received the Holy Spirit. And they did. In a matter of weeks, about 120 of them were gathered together. They weren't just meeting, having a worship service. They were meeting together, the scripture says, in one accord in prayer and in supplication. And the Holy Spirit was poured out and fell upon them. And the church began. Not long after that, Peter and John are going to the temple to pray. It was really in the hour of prayer and they came upon a man 
who could not walk and had never walked. He was 40 years old. And he couldn't walk. And Peter told him, says, look at me. Look at us. And he spoke and said, I, 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 can't, I don't have money to give you, but what I have, I'll give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. And you all know what happened to him, don't you? He stood up and walked and he was doing what? He was jumping and he was leaping and he was praising God for what God had done. But there were religious people there who didn't appreciate that much. In fact, they started dressing down the disciples. They not only dressed them down, they arrested them. They arrested Peter and John and threatened them severely. Threatened them severely. And um, Peter didn't stop. In fact, he came together with his people and they prayed again. And over in Acts 4, chapter 29, he prayed, he said, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants, grant to your servants, grant to us, those who are following you, grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hands to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. I want you all to understand the change that this was in Peter. It was just a matter of weeks before that Peter was confronted, is do you even know the man? And three times Peter, this same person who's praying, this same person who was used by God to bring a healing, had denied that he even knew the Savior three times in a row. Now why is it that he changed? I mean a huge change, a complete change, a radical change in Peter. And I believe it's because of these words we're going to share today in John 14. So if you've got your Bible, let's turn to John 14. I believe it's because these words that Jesus taught on the night before he died had sunk into his heart. And the Holy Spirit had used those words of Jesus and so changed him that his way of thinking was changed forever. And I'm going to tell you, folks, if you will get your mind and your heart around the words that we're going to speak today of Jesus, it will change you forever. It will change your family forever. And I'm going to tell you, it will change this church forever. Y'all ready to go there? Because I think it's the word we need. John 14, chapter 12 through 14. John 14. As y'all know, this is part of the message Jesus is giving on the night before he's crucified. He's just had the Lord's Supper with his, with his disciples. Judas has now gone to go betray him. And he's got 11 disciples sitting right there with him. And he starts teaching them. Verse 12, he says, Most assuredly I say to you, I don't know if we don't talk like that, but I think that just kind of means I'm telling, my wife was saying, let me tell you something. <laughs> I'm telling you something. You need to be listening here. You need to be listening, Peter. You need to be listening, John. I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do. See, he did the Father's works, right? He did the Father's works. He says the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because why? Because I go to the Father. <laughs> and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do it. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 15, verse 7. In eight. In these three sh short chapters, Jesus repeats this. I think you're going to see a theme. He repeats this over and over again in six different verses, seven different times. Verse seven. 
if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Every time I see the word if, my daddy taught me, he's put a circle around it because that's conditional. If, 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 if you abide in me, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, the things that I've been speaking to you, if these words abide in you, and you know they weren't Jesus' word, they were the Father's word because Jesus says he didn't teach anything other than what his Father told him to speak. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. See, it changes all your desires. It changes the things that matter to you when your his words abide in you. And it shall be done for you. For why? By this my Father is what? Glorified. God's given the honor. God's given the glory. God's lifted high. That you bear much fruit. That's when God's glorified, when we start being fruitful. What God's put in us and through us starts producing something that's useful for the kingdom. And so you will be my disciples. John 15, verse 16. He says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And that whatever, whatever you ask, whatever you ask, Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you these things I command you that you love one another. Then over in chapter 16, Jesus is talking about the fact that he's about to be gone and they're about to be very sorrowful. And they're not going to be speaking to Jesus in the flesh anymore. And he says here in verse 23 of John 16, he says, and in that day you will ask me nothing, because he's not going to be there. He says, but whatever you ask who? The Father. Who asked the Father how? In my name. You ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you what? Will receive. Why? That your joy may be full. I'm going to tell you, there's sometimes that our joy is not too full. He's not bothering me. That's my grandson, if you didn't know. He was cheering. Go, Drake, go. <laughs> that our joy would be full. That our joy would be full. I am so convinced that we are living so so far below the expectation of what Jesus intended to give us and call us to do as disciples. Y'all believe that? I mean, I'm telling you, if he's saying right here, whatever you ask, I will do it. But my experience, I'm just going to be real honest with you. Sometimes I'll ask for things and it doesn't seem to happen. And I think, God, am, am I just, am I not believing because there are things I've prayed for, and I mean, I fasted, I prayed, I believed for, I believed it, I believed for my friend's healing, I believed for my friend's healing, and they died, and I think, Father, what am I missing here? And then just in my normal Christian walk, just in our normal Christian walk, our prayers, I, can I just be blunt? They're doggone pitiful. it's okay to have a checklist prayer. I, Father, I, I, I pray for Joe, I pray for Bill, I pray for Aunt Sally's bunions. And God, be with, be with them and be with that person. I'm going to tell you, and sometimes that's as deep as our prayer life goes. I'm telling, that's, I'm telling y'all, that's way down here. That's way, way, way down here, and he wants us to be up here. He says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. It's time for us to start praying bold prayers, ambitious prayers, but prayers not out of my desires, but out of his desires, and that's the biggest difference right now. I've prayed for people, and the truth is it was just God's will that that was their time. You know God can be glorified in death, and God can be glorified in people who have not been healed. Do you know that? God's glorified in Chris Kane. He is. He's glorified in Jackie Mead. And you say, how, 
How can they do it? How can they endure? And man, they give their testimony. I'm going to tell you, God gets the glory. God gets the glory. Sometimes my ideas of what God should do and what His will should be is just not what is the Father's will. I don't understand it, but I know it to be true. There's one thing that's true. It's either Jesus spoke a lie. Did he speak a lie? Do y'all believe what he said? Do y'all believe really what he said? Y'all really believe that whatever you ask in his name, he will do it? Even though you've had times when you made prayers and it didn't happen? Now, how do you reconcile the two? There are a lot of folks who've become atheists because of that very verse. And the devil used the truth of God to tell them that there is not a God who answers prayer. I'm going to tell you there's a God who answers prayer. There's a God who answers prayer. There's one thing he says, I want you to ask in my name. When I grew up, as many of y'all would have done, your parents or somebody close to you taught you how to pray. And I would pray and say a prayer and then say amen. And finally when I got to a certain age, my mama said, you, you, you need to pray in Jesus' name. Y'all, y'all do that at the very end of your, end of, end of your prayer. You've got to pray in Jesus' name. And so that almost kind of became the, I don't know, the, the bow on the, on the top of the package. I mean, it's the, the ending thing. It's the closing words that you say. Uh, I give my prayer, give my long prayer, and then at the end you say what? In Jesus' name, amen, right? But I won't be real honest with you. There's a point in time in my life where that, those words didn't mean anything. They just became habit to me. It became habit. And I'm going to tell you, it's such a habit ingrained in... How many of y'all is that's ingrained in you to say that at the end of your prayers? And that's how you grew up. That's how you were raised. And, and I'm going to be real honest with you. There's sometimes that I start my prayer, Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. That kind of should qualify, shouldn't it? But I'm telling you, I feel odd and I feel strange if at the end I just say amen. It, that's just, it's just ingr- ingrained in me. It's like that's got to be the last few words of a prayer in Jesus' name, amen. That's not what Jesus is talking about. That's not what Jesus is talking about when he says, come in my name. See, Jesus came in the name of the Father, and he came in the name of the Father because he came in the authority of the Father. And Jesus is saying, I want you to come in my name. I want you to come in my authority. I want you to ask for the things that I would ask for. I grew up in a small town where you could go to the grocery store, you can go to the, to the, to the local store and say, I'm here, and will you put it on my daddy's account? I'm, I'm, here, I'm here in John's name. Uh, oh, you John's boy. Uh, that's right. And you know that was good enough? How many of y'all did that? Yeah. Uh, you're John's boy. Oh, well, why didn't you tell me? You know, that's all, that's all I needed to know. You, you came in his name. You, you came in his name. You want somebody to, uh, to do a favor for your friend? You tell them, hey, tell them Skylar sent you. Right? <laughs> tell them. Why? Why do we do that? Because we're expecting what's going to happen. They're going to get a little better treatment, aren't they? Tell them I, tell them, tell them I sent you. Jesus says, so as the Father sent me, so I send you. Jesus has sent us to do the very things that the Father sent him to do on this earth. That's what it means to be a disciple to be a follower of him as we get it into our hearts. I'm not here just to enjoy my life. This is not my life. This is his life that I live. It radically changes us forever. It's not my life. It's his life. It's not I who live, but who? Christ who lives in me. When that's our mindset, when that's our attitude, our whole life changes And so we come to the Father. I remember seeing some movie. I think it might have been Cool Hand Luke. I don't know. Some some movie. And 
he was saying, you know, he was, um, he was probably very irreverent, and I'm not going to repeat some of the words he probably said, but he was pretty much saying, this is Luke here. I know you don't see me much around anymore. He's, he was coming in his own name. And I'm going to tell you, when we start coming in the name of Jesus, Jesus gives us the authority and the power to come in his name. In his name. And he says, whatever you ask. He says, anything you ask. I, I, I won't be real honest with you. So many times my asking is about my circumstances. God, I got a bad circumstance here. I'm asking you to fix the circumstance. I think what God's really wanting to do is to fix me. Maybe I ought to be asking about, Father, will you change my heart? Father, will you give me the ears to hear like Jesus heard so that I speak the words of Jesus? Scripture's talking about us speaking the words as if we were speaking the oracles of God. Where do we get that? We get that from the Father because we start asking the Father to teach us the words so we'll know what to say. I want to know what to do, Father. Father, teach me what it is you're doing. Show me what it is you're doing because I want to join in that work. See, Jesus didn't just launch off doing whatever he wanted to do. He did what the Father was doing. And he revealed what the Father was doing by the things that he, the people that he healed and the way that he went about it. Maybe our prayers need to be, Father, open my ears so I hear your word. Open my eyes so that I see what it is that you're doing because I want to keep doing your works. And I'm not doing it so we can draw a crowd and we're not doing it so we can get a, a bunch of people. We're not going to get it so we can get a, a, a buzz on Facebook. We're not doing it so we can accumulate um, followers of our own. We, we, we do it because it brings honor and brings glory to the Father. It's when our prayers change. Father, bring glory to your name. Bring glory to your name. May your name be made famous in all things and in all circumstances, whether the circumstances are the way that I think they ought to be or not. Father, bring glory to your name. When our prayers start changing to Father, Change me. Give me a heart that's not divided. Give me a whole-hearted devotion to you. And I start spending these times praying about what God wants to do to change me because he wants to change you so that he can use you. He wants to change me that, that the Father is going to be glorified. He said, I do it because I want you to be fruitful. I, want, I do it because we, we do it because we want our joy to be full. And that's what Jesus was praying for. I want to turn over to 1 John chapter 15. This is over in the letter of John. This one really boils down all of these teachings that Jesus gives about it. And it's with now, it's with the years of experience where John has lived this teaching. And so he states it even. I think even more clearly, 1 John 5.18. 1 John 5.18. This is a powerful verse. It's just in line with what Jesus has been teaching here in the verses that we've already read. 1 John chapter 5.15. I don't have it on the screen. So y'all, I didn't get that one until early this morning. John writes, Now this is the confidence... <laughs> that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Y'all see those first four words? First five words? Now, this is the confidence. It's not that we don't know to pray. It's not that we don't know how to pray. I'm telling you, I believe the church as a whole has lost its confidence with God. 
Y'all hearing me? Where's your confidence with them? Where's your confidence that God hears your prayers and he'll do whatever you ask because it's given in the name of Jesus Christ? You come not on your own behalf, but you become on the name, you come in the name of the Father so that Jesus and the Father will be glorified in whatever is being done. Have you lost the confidence that God's going to ask, God's going to answer the prayers that you ask? I have known good Christians who say, why don't you pray about that? God hears your prayers more than he hears my prayers. Y'all have had people do that? We think there's only special people who can pray. No, only spe- special people who pray is just because they've started having the confidence that God is going to hear them and answer the prayers. I want to be around people who have the confidence that God is going to answer their prayers, don't you? You want to be around people who've got confidence with God? This is not being cocky with God. This is not taking um, undue expectation is if somebody just has confidence with God that God's going to hear their prayers Daniel had to have confidence with God when he's in the lion's den (laughs) Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego had to have confidence in God when he asked prayers of them because they would have burned up if he had not been in the fire with them Elijah y'all know about Elijah scriptures say the fervent, you know, the, the, the fervent prayers of, of, a, of a righteous man avails much, does a whole lot. Y'all remember what Elijah did? Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years, and you know what? It didn't rain for three and a half years. And he wasn't rain, asking for God to stop the rain because he was trying to stop a flood or stop a hurricane. He was doing it to get their attention. Because God's word said, if you begin to worship other gods, the skies will become like brass, meaning it will not rain. And Elijah was seeing that it was still raining even though Jezebel was the queen of Ahab and they were worshiping Baal. And he said, God, your word... Your word says it will not rain if we are worshiping false idols. He came to God with God's own words, with God's own promises. He says, God, it's time to do it. God heard that prayer. Was it God's will? Absolutely, because it was already in God's God's word. I really need about two hours to preach this sermon because there's a lot of things for us to talk about of promises that God has made to you that God has stated in his scriptures. Maybe you don't have the confidence right now that God will speak to you in your mind or in your heart. I believe he will if you will ask him. It says if you'll just ask for the Holy Spirit who's our teacher, he'll give him to you. Isn't that what it says? Do we believe it or do we not believe it? But I'm going to tell you that we can also then go to the Word and what does the Scripture say that Jesus will do for us? What things in Scriptures do we already know are God's will? I'm not talking about whether you wear your black shoes or your brown shoes today, something silly like that. I'm talking about things that are in God's will. It is God's will that we would be sanctified and walk in sexual purity. We pray in that over ourselves and over our families and over our church. It is God's will for us to be generous givers, to be thankful givers. Am I praying that over my life, over my finances? Am I praying that over my church? It's God's will that we would make disciples. I start praying, God, change me, change me, change me. I want to be a disciple. And whatever it takes, change me. Change me so that God's will would be done. And we start with ourselves. God, change me. Give me the confidence. And as our confidence starts building, we start praying for other people. Start interceding for other people. 
start asking for God to give us words of wisdom for other people. Asking God to use us to bring healings so that God's name would be glorified so that the greater works will keep being done. We can pray for somebody physically. And they can walk out of this place with a back that's a little bit better or a shoulder that's a little bit better. But if God hadn't healed them, I mean healing their soul, then they'll walk out of here with a sick soul. Doesn't help a whole lot to have a sinner who now just has a back that works better if their heart's not better. Does it? We can pray for people that their finances get better, or that their situations and circumstances are better. But if their soul is not healed by God Almighty, then their situation really hadn't changed much. They're still a slave to sin. They're still like Lazarus in the grave, bound, foot, head, shoulders, by the bondage of sin. And they're not coming out of that until they hear the words from Jesus that say, Lazarus, come forth. I am not capable of speaking that life into you from my own initiative, but I am capable and I have the confidence because we come in the mighty name and the authority of Jesus Christ that when he tells us to speak, come forth and find new life, that it will be done. There are people in here who are struggling right now. You are struggling and you don't know how to get beyond it. And you've lost your confidence in the prayers of your own, your own prayers. You've lost the confidence that God's even going to hear you because you don't think you are worthy enough to get God's blessing. I'm going to come down there. I want to speak to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Jesus says, come forth. Come forth and come to him. All I want us to do right now is for you to come forth. If you're struggling and you feel like you've just been wrapped up, you're just in grave clothes, you've been paralyzed, you're in bondage, you are in sin, you are living in sin, you are surrounded by sin, your circumstances stink just like Lazarus. And Jesus would speak to you, each and every one of you, Lazarus, come forth. And that's up to you. You're going to either come forth or you're going to sit right where you are. But I'm going to tell you, if you're in bondage and if you're in sin, if you walk out this door, you've left behind a healing of your heart and your soul that Jesus gave his disciples the authority to speak. Will you come on up here? So I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask you, each and every one of you, if you don't want to come up here to the altar, then I'm going to ask you to kneel and pray right where you are. And after we have this time of prayer, this is for you that we have lost our confidence in prayer. It's time for us to be bold. Do you all agree with that? It is time for us to be bold. And our families are going to be changed forever. And we've got to quit living down here. We've got to start living up here of having confidence that our Savior Jesus Christ is going to get the honor and the glory and the praise because that's where it belongs. 
And I'm going to tell you, if God's given you a new life, it's not because of me. It's not because of one person in this room. It's because Jesus Christ is calling to you to come forth. But it's time, you know, you know, after Lazarus came forth and he had him still bound with all the grave clothes, you know what Jesus said? Hey, go get those claws off of them. That's your job, disciples, for the people who come forth, for the people who are dealing with this, the people who need life. It's for you to reach out and help them. Help take off the clothes, the sins, the hurts, the pains, everything that's been holding them back. It's our job as Christians to do that. And Jesus will be honored and given glory. Y'all believe that? Y'all stand with me. If you want to spend some time at the altar, now's a great time to do it. But I'm praying that even if you're not coming up here, that in your hearts where you're standing, God will deal with you and speak to you and give you new life. It's time. It's time. Y'all agree? It's time. Y'all lower the lights, please.